Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the SPSP Acute Adult Collaborative Falls webinar series. If we can move to the next slide, please. Welcome to everybody. My name is Jo Matthews. I'm the head of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and head of Improvement Support and Safety here within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. The Scottish Patient Safety Programme aims to improve the safety and reliability of care and reduce harm. A focus on reducing falls within acute hospitals remains a core part of the work to achieve this aim and the key priority for care across Scotland. And that's certainly been indicated by the number of people who have registered for um, today's session. So we're delighted to have you along. Next slide, please. This is going to be, um, as normal, a very interactive session, and I'm sure many of you are familiar now with Teams etiquette, but just to make sure that we have everybody on the same page. Um, on the top row, you will see two symbols. Your camera has been automatically disabled, so please ensure that also that your mic is switched off during the session. And on the bottom row, you'll see another two symbols, one for raising your hand and one for the chat box. We really want people to be as interactive as possible during the session, and there will be an opportunity for you to come in and ask questions at the end of the session. So please start thinking as you're, you're, you're listening to Brian of any key areas that, that you wish to ask. If we go to the next slide, please. As we all have experienced on many occasions, teams can be a little bit temperamental, um, but you'll see here that we have um, contact details for um, support from the acute team. Sarah within our acute team will be managing the, the MS Teams chat box, but also our email is there. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with Sarah if you do need any help. Next slide, please. So this is a fantastic fantastic afternoon focused on creating a culture of change for falls in Scotland and we have a phenomenal speaker um, coming to join us today. As I said there is an opportunity for um, uh, questions which will be facilitated by our, our clinical lead Dr Lara Mitchell um, and then we'll do a general wrap up roughly about 10 past three. So if we go to the next slide, please, and think about that focus on the aims of today's session and really thinking about how can we make falls everybody's business and understanding why that matters. Through that, we're also going to hear and have a discussion about the culture of embracing risk and promoting mobilisation, a key part of the, the, the work of both safety and the work that you're going to hear about through Professor Brian Dolan. And really thinking about then, so how do we shift that model and get a model, a social model for change in Scotland that really promotes that mobilisation across our work on falls? If we go to the next slide, please. Absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, Professor Brian Dolan, who's an OBE and who was described in 2018 as one of the top 20 most influential people within the NHS 70 years existence. Now that to me is a claim to fame. Brian is the Director of Health Service 360, providing leadership, coaching and consultancy within the UK and as far away as Australia and New Zealand. With a clinical background in emergency care, Brian coupled with, with his academic roles, including Honorary Professor of Leadership in Healthcare at the University of Salford and the Visiting Professor of Nursing at the Oxford Institute of Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Research, be no surprise that he has published many papers and authored seven books. In the Queen's 2019 New Year's Honours List, Brian was awarded with an OBE for the services to nursing and emergency care. And what brings Brian here today is his fantastic global social movement called End PG Paralysis, which encourages patients to get up, dressed and moving to reduce their risk of deconditioning while in hospital. Those core messages are such an important part of the SPSP Falls work that boards across Scotland are participating within at this moment in time. And I'm sure you're going to take much away from Brian's session today to support you and your teams in the pursuit of reducing falls. 
There's much more information about NPJ paralysis on the website, which is endpjparalysis.com. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brian and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed for what <laughs> well, feels like a very kind and generous obituary. So thank you so much indeed for that, Joanne. And and what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through the slide deck. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, I think in many ways, it's it's always worth relitigating and reminding ourselves of the pathophysiology of deconditioning and, and why uh, there's such significant consequences when it then comes to, to falls. And then think about a, a model or a social model of change that um, which is about the heart, the heads and the hands, but also the other features of the, the if you will, the three pandemics we've dealt with in terms of, yes, COVID is the uh, obvious one, but two others have been going along and have been accentuated. And and the first, the second one obviously is, is deconditioning, which is now reaching into people's homes and we're seeing a dramatic increase in the number of falls occurring. But there's another one which is again accentuated by the pandemic, but it was there always and is becoming greater than ever. And that, if you will, is a pandemic of loneliness, which also, as we know, is more is 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 very, very harmful. But I'd like, if I may, to I'm, I'm hopefully I will may have access to take control. There's a button here that says take control. So, so I'm going to take control. And uh, I do want to dedicate this this talk to my Uncle Tommy, who would have been 88 yesterday. And he was, to my mind, the embodiment of a culture, of a growth mindset, of somebody who always believed that the best thing you can do is walk, to keep yourself fit, to keep yourself healthy. Um, lived for 70 years in, in the States and we were due to meet a couple of weeks ago, but sadly passed away in August and he was kind of at the heart of our, our family, the last family me member on, on either my mum's or my dad's side and an extraordinary man or as, as we would say of him, he was some man for one man. And that was us on, on the west coast of Ireland, where I'm from uh, about in 2019. But the other thing about him is the power of him is always walking. My my early 60 something um, cousin in Dublin went for a walk with him a couple of years ago. And she's a poor man. He he was he, he took he, he was worn out from from Uncle Tommy. And this is the thing, you know, we if we're really lucky in this life, all of us as uh, uh, our older people in training, and I think sometimes, you know, we treat old people as if they've got all the time in the world. But the reality is they're the ones who are in a hurry. They've got things to do and, and, and us holding on to them, keeping them in hospital at times. Actually, it's stealing their time. And one of the things that occurs to us is that we with it keeping people in a bed doesn't keep themselves it keeps them it, it creates harm for them and dr amit aurora and i co-authored a chapter and we defined deconditioning as comprising physical psychological and functional decline as a consequence of prolonged bed rest and particularly associated with loss of muscle strength and frequently as a consequence of being in hospital and patients spend up to 95% of their time in a bed or chair, whether it's uh, it's 83% of the time in bed, 12% of the time in a chair. And physical inactivity leads to a really high number of deaths in England alone. But we have known about this for a really long time, since before the birth of the NHS. Dr Richard Asher talked about the dangers of going to bed. One of the 20 most influential papers in the 20th century in the British Medical Journal. And while Dr Asher never talked about deconditioning, he was describing it in, in terms of every single body system is impacted by it, whether it's the respiratory system, alimentary canal, um, the skin integrity we know about, um, uh, kidney function, and I'm going to give some examples of, of the, specifically about the harm associated with it, but even people's mental well-being. So you would think we'd have kind of worked out that staying in bed is harmful by, yeah. I'd seen the last 70, 75 years nearly, but actually we've known since before the last century began, when Emile Rees in the States talked about it means a great deal to be put on their feet in a short time rather than confined to beds. 
he a sample size of 400 patients today after their surgery all of them were got up out of bed irrespective of the treatment that they were given or the surgery they had and none of them came to harm most of them in fact left earlier uh, they had a shorter leg stay if you like in more modern parlance in the mid 40s uh the, you had uh, Dr. john powers in cooperstown new york and again, rest as a therapeutic measure is fraught with hazard. Prolonged periods of recumbency in bed on, are anatomically, physiologically and psychologically unsound and unscientific. And yet what we've been doing for decades now is we've been keeping people in beds. We have designed out day rooms. I work in one of many lives in Christchurch and we had in fact it only closed last week. Uh, 3,000 square feet design lab. We mocked up life size versions of operating theatres, wards, paediatric areas, ICUs, GP practices. We had 400 of them that we built out of cardboard. And then we were able to, because they were so light, people could move them around. But the power of it was it we designed in places for, of, of space for people to move. What we also did, I did a quick and dirty literature review about 10 years ago now, partly on the back of the earthquakes, is do we want all single rooms? And of course, the argument has always been, well, single rooms improve patient safety because of the risk of infection. But the biggest determinant of reduced infection is washing your hands, which means it is behavioural more than it is an environmental issue. But the other bit around it is that people feel lonely, they feel disconnected, they feel isolated when they're stuck in a room on their own. And there's some Scottish evidence that came out in 2011, which showed that people who have a fall in a single room tend to be on, their, on the floor longer and tend to come to greater harm. So the rush to single rooms, I think, is not necessarily an automatically a good thing because it's designed for isolation and the other realities we need bigger spaces and more important even more importantly more staff so the consequences of these things are known and it's it's whether we want to take them on but if you go back to 1899 you then have to go back to the 1870s because i wouldn't be a, you know a proper nurse if i didn't mention florence herself and uh, you know, she talked about it's a well-known rule to keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary. And even this may be days too long because the patient may not have to have to, have to recover not only from the illness or injury, but from hospital itself. It seems to me that, yes, if you, uh, sorry, Laura, and I'll try and see if I can do this. Um, about single rooms, I'll assume, Laura Halcrow, you're talking about that Scottish work. Um, my email I'll do in real time is uh, health service 360. Anyone who wishes to email me about any bits, certainly please do so. I'm more than happy to share what I have always. And, that, and by the way, this has been converted into a PDF. The chapter that I mentioned that Amit and I have written has been, uh, it would be PDF'd and also a, a, a resource pay PDF of links to information. So all of this stuff will be available to you because knowledge hoarded is knowledge wasted. And, you know, Florence was wise because in many respects she saw even then about valuing patients time as the most important currency in healthcare. And this, as I said, is the chapter which we are very, very happy to share with any, all of you. So let's drill down further into what is the impact, which then leads to falls, as we know, of bed rest. So within a week, people will lose um, up to 20% of muscle strength, particularly in the glutes and, and, and the, uh, the quads, with really the lower limb anti-gravity muscles, which help them to stand up. One and a half kilos of muscle mass within a week, and a kilo of which, kilo of which comes from the muscles that enable people to stand. Bone demineralization and loss of total body calcium, six milligrams a day and circulatory blood volume reducing by 5%. Now those three bits together, 4% of all people who fall in hospital, or who break their hips, I should say, are people who break their hips in a hospital setting. And think about it, they're on concrete floors at home, they can kind of walk their way around the house, they, can, they know there's a chair to grab. But at home, there are much bigger spaces between bits of furniture. 
and the walls are the, the floors are safer. Sorry, as, as, as obviously it's concrete, they're harder most of the time. They are also in an unfamiliar environment. The late the lights might be down and people who break their hips in hospital settings tend to do to, so so from about day six, seven, eight, nine, that type of time. If you think about it, they've lost muscle mass, they've lost calcium from their bones, which have become thinner, they lose circulatory blood volume, they get up, they fall, they get dizzy. And by the time they've hit the ground, someone will have taken the head off the acetabulum. So falls are a real thing. And there is an argument, well, if we have people keeping an eye on them, so-called sitters, maybe that will help. But all sitters do is they're just simply there as witnesses to the falls. Because too often, sadly, what's going on is people are just going through their phones. And that's that's the reality of it. In fact, I don't think we should have sitters. What we should have is movers. Their job is to pe have people mobilising and moving around the hospital ward settings and, and taking them out for about. And I've never yet met a wanderer, by the way. These are people who are on their way somewhere. We don't know where it is yet, but they're they're in a, they're on a mission to get somewhere. Looking at VO2 max, I had a drive by shooting of COVID back in April. And although I was absolutely grand, my own VO2 max dropped by about one and a half percent. And it took several days, uh, sorry, weeks indeed, to recover my VO2 max. Pulmonary function, if you are sitting up, you're, you know, or standing, you're using all of your rib cage, all of the intercostal muscles lying back means that people are lying, that they're, they're using half of that, leading to thicker secretions, inefficient coughs and so on. And I'm glad you like that thing of the loop, the movers, not sitters. That's just popped into my head. Um, blood glucose for the days of inactivity. It takes weeks for it to come back to normal. Peristalsis, because if you're not moving around, you've got reduced peristalsis. People are not drinking as much. You don't have the, the gravity feed through the uh, the descending colon for the feces, which then becomes even more um, constipated and solid. UTIs as a cause of increased diuresis. And remember the calcium mineral, mineral and other mineral extractions, excretions, forgive me, leading to kidney stone in up to 15 to 30 percent of patients. The other bit that happens is because there isn't the gravity feed from the ureters and into the bladder, the bladder doesn't fully empty, which means it becomes, if you like, a Petri dish, dish for infections. And of course, we also then know about skin integrity being compromised. That one we know. But if you look at the pre-hospital, the work so of, uh, of Falvi et al., where your people are traveling along as frail older adults and have a, a, a decline over time, whereas people, older people with hospital associated deconditioning, it's like falling off a cliff. That, that, that drop off is much, much more acute. So being sick and in hospital, in fact, has iatrogenic consequences. And then look at the mental impact, the lethargy, the, the, the loss of motivation where people's get up and go has got up and gone. The torpor, the misery, the loss of sense of independence and loneliness itself. And when you think about what we've all been dealing with through, uh, you know, the healthcare in a pandemic, you know, the upended rituals, there's, um, you can see the top right there. I think, there's, you know, as I was saying about, there's nothing as lonely as a small funeral. And my auntie died in February of last year during one of the, the lockdowns. Uh, in Ireland, her two sons live in Ireland, her two daughters are in London, they couldn't get home. So there's nothing more distressing and the, leading to complex grief of saying goodbye to a loved one over Zoom and when only 10 people could be in the church. Or again, you know, people saying goodbye through an iPad. Um, the, 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 I often look at this picture on the bottom right. And what really strikes me about it is, is I wonder if that clinician, be they a nurse, a doctor, a therapist, knew that that woman had her 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 jumper and her back and her top up behind it, because I can't imagine they'd have done that with any intention. So all of these things, these rituals and shielding, the, the notion of shielding of people, we saw from the Canadian research, there was a significant increase in earlier than expected deaths from dementia as a consequence in the Canadian care homes of people being isolated from families, which kind of makes sense. And then, and by the way, I, I do prefer the, the Irish phrase, they instead of talking about shielding, they talk about uh, cocooning, which is looking after people. And there's a wonderful Scottish uh, or, or Glaswegian um, psychologist called Dr. Lisa Morton, who has a book out 
in coming in January called Hearts and Minds, which is about living with and um, uh, lifelong heart disease. And she has been somebody who's clinically vulnerable, talks about protecting endangered species. And I, I really quite like that. But also as a consequence of loneliness, we run and it's npjparalysis.org and we have access to what are now dozens and dozens of talks over the last four years for our npjparalysis.org summit. And last year, we had some of the physios, community physios from the, from the Republic of Ireland alongside the, the care, the nursing lead for older people in Ireland, Deirdre Lang. And they talked about visiting people in their homes. And these were men and women who lived on their own. But they were no longer going to the, the to the GAA, the Gaelic football and hurling matches. They were no longer going to mass. Their lives had become smaller, leading to much greater loneliness. And any of you are on this call, the 180 plus people are here. It's brilliant to have you here. If you work in community settings, my guess is some of you are finding people have got a cup of tea for you because you may be the only person that they see in all of that time. And loneliness increases the likelihood of mortality by fully 26%, which uh, Julia Holt Lunton found, um, Lunston found that that was the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And loneliness leads to more early deaths than diabetes or obesity. Loneliness is a big issue. And when you think about it, people are far more likely to fall because they're not looking after themselves. So let us, if we may, have a look at a short film about loneliness. So that video is finishes with saying that you know over half a million people don't see anybody um, at all in the time they're in hospital. Oh, sorry, don't forgive me. Uh, in, in in over six days a week, um, <laughs> I think because it's 2022, health boards need to get past the fact that YouTube is a thing and it's the second biggest search engine after Google. Um, but, uh, you know, you're right. Thank you, Jane. It's, it does. It, it makes you think. That, and full disclosure, my son, Will, is a videographer and filmmaker, and he wrote, directed, and actually had that little cameo in that in that piece. And you'll see some more of his work uh, presently, and the link will be available. But the power of it is it makes people realise that sometimes you just need to pick up the phone and ring the ones you love rather than waiting to do so. 
But you know, if you look at the impact, hospitalized patients are 61 times more likely to develop disability and activities than activities of daily living than those who are not hospitalized. Nearly a sixth of people who are older medical patients who walked independently two weeks before they got to hospital need walk help walking out. And it seems to me that there may be a question which is this. Perhaps is the patient safe for admission may sometimes be a better question than is the patient safe for discharge? Because while there is an important place for hospitals and it's not, I mean, I'm hospital trained, I'm dual qualified nurse, I'm really proud and love being a nurse, but we have to ask some legitimate questions. And it's also tied into this one. If you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? And so Linda Holt and I, Linda Holt is the is the uh, director, Professor Linda Holt, um, who's director of Health Service 360 and an emergency nurse by background as well. And we're currently working on a book. It won't be a big book. I just need to get the book done and it'll cover all of this, but it'll also cover what can you do to make it better, to prevent and avoid and mitigate against the, the, its integration. Because as the wonderful Chris Tuckett says, patients don't stop moving because they've deconditioned. They've deconditioned because they've stopped moving. And we often think of falls as a as a problem of mobility, but actually they're not. They're actually a problem of immobility. And what we've done is we've socialized people into thinking, actually, I think I'll lay, lie here to reduce my risk of falling, because that's what we've kind of done. That we, people have been persuaded. We've had this narrative for decades of people keeping people safe. And actually what we're doing is we are killing them with our kindness, not out of malice, but out of good intention. And this is where I think the culture change comes in and I reflect a lot of this sort of stuff and to my mind culture change is about combining hearts heads and hands and it is in that order we don't make our decisions logically we make them emotionally and nothing happens until somebody feels something so hearts are the about the connection with the stories because and heads is the strategy the context and the plans and the hands okay I want to do something you see, logic and reason and evidence, they inform the heart, but it is the heart in the end that decides. And this is where the reason and the wisdom coming in is now, where do you put your energy? Because we can't put it everywhere. So that is to focus on the things that are within our circle of control not our circle of concern, the things we can do things about. And it's about letting go of things that we can't do stuff about. As, as, a, and as an exec director on the south coast of England, but also a clinical director, which I know is unusual for nurses of a couple of emergency departments. And I'd say to the team, let us not worry about beds. Let us focus on the things that we can do stuff about. And in that, they got better and better and better. In fact, in January, would you believe, in our January, some years ago now, 100% of patients were out of the emergency department every day for over a week in a January. Because the more you focus on what you, your circle of influence, the bigger it becomes. And that takes courage and it takes uh, it takes commitment and it's about doubling down on what matters to us and what matters to us is values about that desire to do better for other people. It's about that act of service that we are part of something bigger than all of us and they take courage and they take commitment. And it's also when you think about emotionally the impact of the hospital gown on, on patient well-being. So Lisa Morton, Nicola Cogan, again in in um, in uh, Caledonia University, uh, University of Caledonia, um, in Glasgow. My apologies if I've got the name wrong. But you know the three elements from a sample size of four hundred, the symbolic embodiment of the sick role, where the gown acts as a symbol of of illness, the emotional and physical vulnerability that people feel because of their wearing one of the most hideous pieces of, of clothing they ever invented, the relinquishing of control because you turn from somebody who was a teacher, a lawyer, a cleaner, a shop worker into a patient and 
the 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 the, the loss and the sense of lack of personal agency or control that is turns from what is a necessary thing into a diminishing thing something that makes us feel like we're no longer a person we've turned into a patient but remember it's the universe as as muriel reichers or the poets you'd say the universe is made of stories not atoms and we connect through story we make sense of the world through story and I think about my Uncle Tommy and the stories I've learned in the last four or five years of his life, because he'd ring all of us on the go and FaceTime. Let nobody tell you old people don't do tech. He was he, he was ahead of all of us. And he would tell the stories of my family and the stories about when, when long before I was born, because he was born in 1934. My parents were born in 1920 and my, my dad in 26 and all the carry on. And so you learn about stuff. And when we connect through story, that's when things become real to us. It's about the stories we tell. Instead of talking about a person being a, a false risk, it's OK, how do we improve their mobility? It's our mindset is the determinant of where what happens to us. And then you get the great work from the NPJ Paralysis Campaign of the likes of the wonderful uh, senior physiotherapist in NHS Highland, Derek Laidler, who came up with this glorious Donald Wedge of Trousers to get people up, get dressed and moving, and pretty soon you'll start improving. If you make stuff fun, if you make it enjoyable, if you make it something that people connect to, then what will happen is people will say, this is our campaign. We can make a difference to our people because the story is no Scotsman, woman, no Scots person should ever come to harm. Now I'm going to show, uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip past the next video because there's significant challenges with the videos. But what I want to, what the, the links will be made available for all of you to be able to see. So the thing is this. When it comes to story, hope is the conviction that despair will never have the last word. And when it comes to stories, I strongly believe in the power of hope and hope isn't something fluffy. Hope is something that is about the. Hope is 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 is, is something with tender roots that gets poisoned by cynicism. And hope as as the, the great Irish poet, um, you know, Seamus Heaney, when he was talking about Vaclav Havel, the Czech poet come president, he turned into president and he talked about hope is not to believe that things will always work out. Hope is to believe that something is worth fighting for. And right now for all of us, it would be easy to turn our face down and think we have got patients hanging out the door. We've got patients in the backs of ambulances. People turning up in the world already have come to harm. We have got no staff. We can't make it better. But actually, this is not our first rodeo. 20 years ago, we were in this position. We're in it again now. But those who believe that we can be better, those are leaders. And leaders never give up hope. And if any of you worked with a hopeless leader, because actually what they are is hopeless. And our uh, our collective responsibility is to make sure we that despair never gives up, gives us the last word. And and Derek, thank you for that generous comment. The the um I'm going to Jennifer. I'm going to come to the point about falls as well. Absolutely about how we reframe the language. So the heads, the things, what are the plans? What are the things that, if you like, if the stories are the why, then the, the, the heads are the, the how and the what. And here is something that's going on right now. These were, so this is stuff that finished. I'm going to go into what they're doing right now. This is the East of England, the deconditioning games. Um, some of you may recall the chapel here on the right. Uh, this is when he got his MBE at, um, I think it was in, uh, this was in um, in Norfolk. This is Mr. Motivator and his job who's now well into his 50s or early 60s. And that's that's Mrs. Motivator, his wonderful wife. They were encouraging people, creating videos for people. They were doing all kinds of extraordinary things um, to get people up. They had 178 teams participated, whether they were in hospitals, in care homes, in community centers, in mental mental health services. And what they did, their 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 staffing is as atrocious as it is where you are. 
And what they did is they created new ways of working and new ways of thinking and new ways of having fun that got people up, dressed and moving. They changed the culture. And Belfast, sorry, Belfast, Blackpool, I've been doing some work with them and look at their strategic aims, where over three years they wish to, uh, number one, reduce preventable deaths, two, reduce avoidable harm, and three, improve the last thousand days of life. That strategic goal, that high little aims in informing some extraordinary work that they're doing. The deconditioning goings people, again, back to them, they're reducing, uh, raising awareness, having fun, preventing avoidable harm. And they're doing it in things like introducing static pedals to a dialysis unit, having a winter Wimbledon on the wards with patients batting around the, um, the, the, the balloons, care home pedometers, doing a virtual walk to the seafront, to South End seafront. Di data which showing the impact about the number of patients out of bed in time for lunch and you can see the trends going in all of the right direction and they had some 178 teams participating and sustainability was important because the right thing to do for patients and staff we will keep this going beyond the end of their campaign because when you make the right thing to do the easy thing to do when things work for patients they invariably work for staff when people own the sense of we are making a difference, then the job of leaders is simply be directors of permission giving. And so last week we started the National Reconditioning Games, uh, inspired by Dr. Um, Amit Aurora, who again is a geriatrician in, in Stoke, a wonderful leader in, 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 in uh, medicine and geriatrics. And this is not just, by the way, for NHS England, it is open to anyone who wishes to sign up and join. And it's about how do we create, and again, anyone who wants to email me, really happy to send the links to all of that, uh, to get people to join. Because people are now joining from the Republic of Ireland, from Belfast, from, from Northern Ireland, from Wales, and even in Australia. And they've got medals, everyone loves medals, about making a difference and all those things. And, and the games in Scotland for care homes, that's brilliant to see Leanne, that's fantastic. And of course, as I said, you can access our NPJ Paralysis Gold um, uh, Summit. This is all free, just register and all that information is available free. Yes, Claire, all of us can be all directors of permission giving, every single one of us, because leadership isn't a job title, leadership is a mindset. And frankly, I've seen people who are war clerks who had more director of permission giving about themselves than anything else. So it's it's about how we lead. And and if everything, every one of us in this life, we all want two things. We want to be seen and we want to be heard. And that's all we're looking for, to support others to succeed. And remembering that pajamas say you're unwell whereas clothes say to you there's a cognitive shift that occurs because clothes say you're getting better and when we did our uk-wide npj paralysis campaign um uh in um uh, uh back in 2018 there was some feedback we were getting from i think it was registrars in edinburgh which is they were discharging more patients at weekends when they saw people dressed so that is that's a thing. So there's a cognitive shift. The, the patient starts to think I'm feeling better. The family says, oh, look at you, ma'am. You're looking great. You're wearing lippy today. That's great. And, and, and the, the clinicians say, maybe they could go home today. And as a good friend of mine says, what woman wants to be seen in a hospital bed when she's not even wearing her lipstick or a bra? And I think there's so much dignity and respectfulness in that about how do we encourage people to feel themselves again? And you you asked the question earlier um, about about the the language and and the type of language we that we use, Jennifer. And this is how I think about this stuff. Instead of us talking about false prevention, and instead of us having false preventions leads, it seems to me a better thing is to have safer mobility leads because the false prevention is a deficit mindset where a safer mobility is about an, an assumption that people do fall, people will fall. It's how do we encourage them to mobilise? Because the funny thing is, the more you're walking, the less likely you are to fall. And the more you're walking, the less likely you are to fall coming to harm. 
uh, banned the base and encouraged the use of bathrooms to those who could. Absolutely, Lindsay, dead right. Um, and I can't remember where it was, but there's uh, NPJ, embedding NPJ paralysis, a Scottish paper in the nursing standard, and they got rid of all of their uh, their bottles and bedpans in a stroke unit. Now, if they can do it there, they absolutely can get people up and moving. Because suppose I said to you, listen, um, the toilets at work, they're broken. And so everyone's just going to we'll pull a curtain around. So everyone today is just going to have to use, um, you know, just use a, a bedpan. And obviously, uh, clearly, when we pull the curtain, nobody can hear a thing. It's all around how do we get people up and about, but also thinking something you can start tomorrow. Instead of thinking about how do we reduce length of stay, maybe we should frame it as let's give patients back their time. Something you could do on your next handover, instead of asking how long has a person been in hospital, what is their length of stay? Maybe a better question to ask is how many days have they been away from home now? Because it's not about how long they're in hospital, it's how long they're away from home that matters most to people. And history taken feels almost plunderous because everyone comes to hospital. Then, well, on triage, every single person who came to a triage was asked the same question. What's the story? Because patients don't present with symptoms. They don't present with diseases. They come with they come with a story that they need to tell. And our job is to translate what is the story they're telling us so we can turn it into a picture that helps us to clarify what services we need to ever give them, what medical and not nursing and therapy treatments we need to offer them. So they're not it's not us plundering their histories. It's encouraging them to tell their stories. And instead of hospital in the home, us all remembering there is no ward like home. We are guests in their lives. They are not just our patients. And in a care home, we are going to their home. Um, it's Jane, patients, you know, you're right. Ban slippers because you want to slippers do slippers make you slip. So we've had hearts, we've had hands and heads, and now it's about the hands, the what to do. And this is about sharing the message. We've said to, to decades to patients, go to hospital, you'll be safe there. And now we're going, yeah, about that. You know, it's about encouraging people to, to get active because we need to shift the narrative here. Take the clothes. And that's like, oh, well, actually, we really need to keep have their clothes. Um, the 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 posters that the wonderful uh, Sonia Sparkles dot com. Go to her website. She's prolific. The stuff she does is free. Sonia Sparkles dot com. And she is a uh, worth her weight in petrol for the wonderful stuff that she creates. In my hometown in the west of Ireland, in, in Castlebar County, Mayo, a few weeks ago, I was invited to cut the ribbon. Now, I'm from the wrong side of town. You know, we were the, we were the children our mothers told us to keep away from. And to end up doing a thing where just cutting the ribbons, a whole, it's a, a circle closed. But these, uh, led by a nurse and, and some therap uh, OTs and physios and a patient, John, who kept everyone straight on straight and narrow. It's 130 metres of a patient walkway that people and every 30 minutes there's a, there's posters you can see about exercises they can do. There is amazing photographs, six foot by four foot photos of County Mayo, our 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 home county that people could stop and watch. And these you can see the photographs of all of us from a couple of weeks ago with the wellness walk. Now, what a brilliant world class piece of work that they've done. And every few stations there's five stations for lower upper body exercises, all sorts of stuff. And I'll just go back one, the chap in the middle, John with the jacket, he was in hospital for six months with necrotizing fasciitis and he never gave up walking. So happy again, if you if you don't mind emailing me, then I'll connect you with the wonderful people of Mayo University Hospital who I'm sure will want to do that stuff. Happily so, Hikara. Let's look at what happened in go circle back to Blackpool. What they did is they worked, Cute Trust worked with the care homes and they reduced significantly the number of falls leading to care home attendances. And in one, they had a driver diagram, you know, we reduced falls for Jean, a, a, a woman uh, from um, to below five per week. She was falling several times a day. So they have a driver diagram. 
And what they did is they dramatically reduced her falls. And you can see here over time, the number of days that went that passed without her having a fall from one and a half days to 4.5 days. They reduced falls in one care home by two thirds. The, I don't know what's going on in the water of, of Glasgow, but the amazing people that are the likes of Dawn Skelton, uh, Juliet Harvey, Erin Walker, and so many others, the Active Water Group, doing brilliant, brilliant stuff based on Brendan McCormack's work, who is in now Professor of Nursing in Sydney and Head of School in Sydney, about how do we keep the humanity on supporting people to do the right thing, which is about connecting, collaborating, communicating and coming to consensus of what they do. Absolute enduring effort. Scotland is doing outstanding stuff. It really is. It leads the NHS in England for dust in so many ways. And I don't say that out of any disloyalty or to bloke smoke. It just everything I observe about the, what you're doing in Scotland is so inspiring. And also, you know, the work of the the the, um, the improvement teams you have in Scotland, uh, like you know, everyone whose names I won't name because I know I'll, I'll forget a few that have been done. And Lara Mitchell, Dr. Lara Mitchell, now the Falls lead for Scotland. Brilliant, brilliant people and looking at the outcomes that they achieve. So let's start looking at the NPJ House at home, because how do we get people to do stuff easier? Make it simple for people. The trick is focus on what you can control because culture doesn't change simply because we want it to change. It changes when behavior and everyday realities change. That's how we change the culture of falls and everything else. Because to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And hopeful thinking is that the future will be better than the present. That I as a person have the power to make it so because I am my own director of permission giving to myself to make it happen. That there's many ways to those goals to achieve it and none of them are free of obstacles. But hopeful thinking is believing that something is worth standing for. Because here's the thing, one day which will come too soon, we, instead of being delivering care, we'll be the ones receiving care. This is about our own future older selves. It's our collective responsibility to make it better for us as we make it better for people now as well. And valuing patients' time is that care will always be more important than cure. And this is the reason why. Because the amount of cure we can get that's limited. There's only so much cure available. We all we all have to die in the end. But care is limitless from before we're born to after we pass. We don't have intensive cure units. We have intensive care units. Care will always be more important than cure. And remember this to my mind. This this is the the century of older people this is the century of gerontology and gerontologists are like archaeologists. They look past what others see as ruins to the beauty that lies within. And, you know, you look at what brought me into emergency care wasn't trauma. It was older people, psychiatrically unwell people, homeless people, the unloved and occasionally unlovable, looking at the ruins at the beauty of all of those men and women and others that and people who came into our care. But here's the thing as I draw this towards its end. It's that some people are so poor that all they have is money. And when you think across Scotland every day, a million acts of kindness are undertaken to value people's time, to offer people dignity, autonomy and humanity. But in doing so, they remind us why we all came into healthcare in the first place. And, you know, it's how do we look after ourselves and remembering that the last thousand days matter, because if you're a man, you can expect to live to the age of 78 and a woman to the age of 83. But if you're a 75 year old man or an 80 year old woman, what you have is a thousand days. And every day somebody spends longer in hospital than they must is stealing their time. Every day they don't get out of bed. It is stealing their time unless the only reason they're in bed is a clinical one. Because if we can get them up and dressed and moving, we will get them home to people we will never meet, loved ones we will never see. 
and let us let us eradicate the language of failed discharges because if somebody gets home for just two days and sees their grandchildren that is no failure no failure at all our collective responsibility is to look after each other and ourselves and one day we will be in our last thousand days and we can look back and say i may never have got rich or famous but i mattered i matched to my family i matched to my community i mattered to the uniform i wore with pride the profession i loved as a member of it and i think if you can say i was loved i mattered i was enough then you've led the life of a social millionaire so thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's really thank kind. You. Thank you so much, Brian. That was uh, incredible. There were so many powerful messages in, in there. That I wouldn't want to even start listing them, but I know I certainly, at the end of my shift today, the first thing I'll be doing is picking up the phone. Um, so I'm going to pass over now to Dr. Lara Mitchell, who is going to lead our Q&A session. And my goodness, the chat box has been incredibly busy. I am sure there will be many questions coming. So thank you again. Hi, everybody. Uh, Lara Mitchell here, National Clinical Lead for Frailty. And Brian, thank you so much. Whenever I listen to you, I have just so many sound bites. Um, so keep the questions coming in, but going through my head is movers, not sitters. I know that resonated. Knowledge hoarded is knowledge wasted. Um, leadership isn't a position, it's a mindset. Um, that whole thing about how we connect with stories, and that's the language about how we should communicate, connect, collaborate. Um, my goodness, it was a very emotional and so much information. So I know there's lots of lovely words coming in that you'll be able to read. Um, so just going through to some of the questions, uh, Jennifer had um, asked right at the beginning, um, full, full refers to the problem um, and what that is and, and how do we um, change that culture of that false language. So anything different, a different take that you can give us on that? Yeah, and thank you. And I think, and thank you all for the lovely comments as well. It was very kind and generous. And I think the one most is, is we change the language away from a deficit model of language about false towards safer mobility. Because once people start to realize their job is encouraging people to move more safely, then what they won't do is keep them in bed and with you know the old handrails putting on slippers on them because slippers make you slip um telling people to stay in bed because what we do to patients is now stay in bed and if you need anything just give us a, you know let us know ring the bell so what they do is they sit there quietly and decondition mm -hmm. because we because they do what we tell them and that's the last thing we need to do we need to i think that this the change isn't in our patient's mindset as much as anything it's in our mindset because when we take no risks, the patient's taking all the risk. And we say, I'm not happy for that person to be discharged. It's not about our happiness. It's about their happiness that matters. Oh, they failed their stairs assessment, their sales test. Well, they live in a bungalow. Do you know, we've got to kind of, what is the risk they want to take? Not the ones that we want to take. It is their lives that we need to acknowledge, not a paradigm of ours superimposing our lovely values in ways that actually may not meet the lives that they choose to live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love that, that someone, Juliet's come, come in and said she's going to look at changing her title now to Safer Mobility Lead. And maybe awesome. that's just a step in, in changing that culture to, as to how we talk about falls. And gradually that will happen and soon safer mobility leads will be advertised around Scotland. Yeah. Um, yeah and, so and you know what? You can start doing it. Just, you know, do it first, apologize later, blame me. Um, start calling yourselves at work. I'm the safer mobility lead or the safer mobility practitioner. The job title is just in the job title in just a, a job description, you know. Just create, the, just create, just tell people what you are. And by the way, HR can come follow later on. You know, just, just do it because you know it's the right thing to do. 
Yeah, absolutely. And Kirsty Ward's come in with another question here. The majority of hip fracture patients are admitted from home. How do we influence falls prevention or safer mobility in this setting? There's a wonderful, thank you for that. And there's a wonderful piece of work done in, again in Canterbury, in Christchurch, in New Zealand. And it was a physio led program about um, safer, safer mobility in the home. And it's simple things teach you. To, um, talking to doing assessments, also talking to to, to to people, older people in their own homes, which would be doing a, an assess a risk assessment, encouraging them when they every time they're having a meal, instead of you know before instead of using their arms to to get themselves out of the chair, standing up and doing it ten times, you know, so it's a bit of exercise when they're at the at the sink or brushing their teeth to stand on one foot, which is actually about and you can use a single finger if you're doing it with dishes, but you know to keep yourself stable. But doing that, and what that's doing is about building core. And really? what they found is it meant that they had 20 fewer orthopedic beds needed at system level. And falls reduced quite significantly. Falls leading to fractured neck and femurs reduced um, significantly. The orthopods requested the information on the morbidity and mortality. They saw that those numbers were all in the right direction because what it was around was in finding them early. So, for example, the GP uh, receptionist could refer them to the the, the physio team because they would watch how the patient would get up when they were called in the GP practice and say that person really struggled to get out of the chair I can refer them because they have a real life assessment going on you see you don't always need to be a clinician to assess it if you watch a match and somebody's um you know, say, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I won't go into the, the, the Celtic versus Rangers thing, but let's say somebody's trying to get a foul. Everyone knows they're doing it. And somebody gets injured and they come down really heavily. There's 80,000 people said, oh, that looks nasty. What are they doing? They're doing triage. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be a hyper qualified person. We can get this stuff happening in people's homes. And that's why the Sonia Sparkles poster could be put up in GP practices, little things, have a drink, you know, all of those things can reduce falls in home settings. Uh, absolutely. And it's uh, it's having that shared language of how we speak and how that percolates out. I know um, Scott's commented there, he brushes his, his teeth standing on one leg and actually my parents do that every evening so it's just it's how you change the culture as a nation um to being more active um and, and i've got a comment here from derek saying he sees a sad regression in culture of getting people up and dressed and moving on hospital wards post covid and i think that's something to do with the the pressure in the system and how short staffed we are um is this widespread and any solutions it'd be interesting to see what you've picked up from around the UK, Brian, um, and what solutions have we got for giving teams back their mojo and reinvigorating campaigns? For sure. So the short answer, sadly, and, and you know, Derek is always so wise and insightful and is absolutely spot on about this. And the short answer is yes. The only thing that changes around the world when it comes to healthcare is the accent. You know, because everywhere is uniquely similar and everywhere is facing this stuff. So there is the, you know, the recondition, the nation work that's now being started last week in, in, in across England is very much about reinvigorating, revitalizing previous campaigns, because sometimes we all need a reminder that we need to do these sorts of things. And, you know, the it, it we much done, much still to do, I think is how I would frame it. And culture doesn't change. Um, at scale, what it does change and, and change isn't top down or bottom up. Real change is side by side, one heart, one mind, one conversation, elbow to elbow. That's how change occurs. And that's why I love the Donald Wedge of Truths poster, for example, because mm. it speaks the truth locally. In um, in Alberta, they've got them all dressed up as, as lumberjacks in their pastures because that is so Canadian, isn't it? So they're all uh, they're all lumberjacks and they're OK. Brilliant. And, and, I, and I love that because it is that co-design work with with the patients and I was actually wondering with your reconditioning is are, are the changes co-designed with the patients yeah 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 Brilliant. very much so and you know if you if you if you forget everything if you want to do great design start with the patient 
and work backwards. What is it the patient? What do they want? What that's supposed to us? We think that it's no, let's just find out and work. And honestly, they don't want a Rolls Royce. They want a reliable Ford Fiesta in most cases. So that the Rolls Royce is looked after for the people who really, really need it. But actually, we just want to get from A to B and out home again. Absolutely. Yeah. A lovely comment here, uh, Brian, from Gordon Robertson, um, the Scottish Am He's up in Grampian in Aberdeen. So it's lovely to see mm -hmm. on here, Gordon. The Scottish Ambulance Service now has a national hub which show, um, allows ambulance staff to refer regional fall pathways. That's really encouraging to see. Um, we're getting great engagement for ambulance staff. So it'd be great if you can share your learning with them. Still lots to do, but going in the right direction. That's lovely to hear, Gordon. Yeah, um, and actually, if I may quickly come in about the ambulance yeah. service. So Warwick, Warwickshire Hospital uh, is my local hospital in the Midlands near Stratford-upon-Avon. And they use the fire service to get people home. And the fire, you know, they'll go in and they'll quickly have a quick check of the um, fire alarms and all sorts of things like that. And it's working on in an ambulance service that's under vast pressure. They have an SLC a service level agreement with the fire service to do this. And it works brilliantly because as one fire chief put it, Fire services, they no longer put out hot stuff with wet stuff. A lot of their work now is keeping communities safe and and, and for the ambulance service doing stuff like that as well. The more these, they, there should be no them, it should be only us, all of us having a vested interest in all of this stuff. So it's brilliant to see what you say there, Gordon. Yeah, absolutely. And and a, a reminder here from Jennifer, who's who said not all falls are caused by lack of strength and balance. Absolutely agree, Jennifer. Um, and I'm always teaching my medical students. In fact, I was busted the other day because I had a new medical student and he was able to tell me the biggest risk factor for a fall. He was the first medical student who told me and he, he then shared that actually he told if you're on Dr Mitchell's ward round that's what she'll ask you. Um, <laughs> so top five causes of falls are all to do with previous fall strength and balance but agreed we do need individualized risk assessment because there will be other things going on so that that's a nice uh, reminder Jennifer thank you for that. Um, Oh, I, I like that. We should use the Bruins. Um, that's a good thought. Jane, thanks from NHS Grampian. Why don't you take that forward and share with us some changes? Um, Claire, um, I'm trying to rapidly go through all of the comments because there's so many, Brian. Um, as an arts therapist, it's making me wonder about how we can improve the aesthetic environment in hospital. Absolutely, and amen to that. That's something I'm really passionate about, Claire, because when I've done any co-design work, they all mention the hospital environment. Um, active engagement in walking, dancing, playing, drawing and enrichment. And I think that's a really good point, um, especially with COVID. We've obviously it, that's changed things and how we can be active. But it'd be great to get your comments, Brian, on that. And also just looking to the future, how XR might be used with helping us with that. So that'd be great to hear your comments on that, Brian. Yes, yeah, so thank you. So, so um, in, again, my hometown, you know, you've got these massive six foot by four foot images of, of our home county and little things around it. It's just gorgeous. So you want to go to find out what they've done in the, I think it's the matter in Dublin. I love this and this could so readily be applied in anywhere in Scotland is every 10 metres you've got a county. So you start in Dublin, which is the centre, and then you move 10 metres to Wicklow and then 10 metres to Wexford and then to Waterford and to Cork and to Kerry. And people getting excited, oh, I walked all the way to Galway today. And I think that's brilliant because what if you can gamify it, that makes it a lot more fun in terms of active engagement. Absolutely. But it also gives people those goals. In Blackpool, they've got a massive, huge, it must be about 15 metres wide and about th you know, um, three metres high of the Blackpool promenade, including the tower and all that stuff. And when they've had walking trains, which is what they do, they're walking trains, you have people who may well have dementia and they're talking about in the 40s and the 50s about what it was they were doing. The other point about music, uh, Claire, is if you are 70 today, you in 1972, 50 years ago, you were 20. Now, you were not listening to Glenn Miller or Vera Lynn. You were listening to The Who, Black Sabbath, Clearance Clearwater Revival, The Beatles, The Stones, you know, Black Sabbath, early ACDC. 
you know, older people, they have rock and roll hearts. So creating a Spotify playlist, what were the top, the number, uh, the number ones of 1972? Create a Spotify playlist, get cheap uh, earphones so they can have a silent disco. And if they have dementia, what they'll do is they'll give themselves some physio while they're at it by bopping away and cheering them up. Little stuff. And as arts therapists, gosh, you are in, so important. The things you bring that is beauty to the environment, so the aesthetic environments of hospitals. So we need more of you. And um, just just get on with it. I think I can't keep saying that enough is just assume you have permission to make it better because when I trust the clinicians, because when you think this is stuff we can do and get on with it, what leaders do is say good on you for getting on with it. Absolutely. Um, so I, I'm running out of time and we've got a lot of links coming in here that we will share. Um, there's a question from Daniel. Any recommendable tools for mobility assessment in hospital? I don't and I, and I will stay in my lane if I may on that particular mm -hmm. one, but I suspect there's an awful lot of people who would have far more wisdom and insight and experience, which sounds like a hospital pass, but um, I'm OK with saying I don't know. And actually, you know, leaders, successful leaders will say, I don't know. What do you think? So, uh, uh, yeah. you know, and I'm we're sure kind of, you do that, Laura. I, we're, I know we're, you do. we're definitely moving away from pigeoning everybody into how likely they are to fall rather than everybody has a falls risk and let's assess. Um, Laura, Laura, some, there's connections going on there and about falls work in the prison. Um, there's so much here that we actually can't cover it all. And I'm really keen to get back to your wisdom, Brian. Um, there's so much energy in the room. It's really powerful. You've 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 really touched our hearts um, about what changes we can make. And it's about us influencing the people we work with. Um, so if I'm going to ask you, what one thing would you say to our team here listening here and to others in the future? What would you encourage them when they go back to their workplace to do to make things better? I think it wouldn't mean me necessarily prescribing one thing, but what I would say maybe is this. Next Tuesday, do something really tiny that is so small that if it doesn't work out, you can change it back on Wednesday. And so that every Tuesday becomes Change Tuesday. And could you imagine at scale every week, 50 weeks of the year even, in, in 50 environments, doing 50 changes across Scotland? It will be thousands of changes because Change Tuesday becomes the day you have a crack at having a go at things. And I promise you, most of them will work because when people have an idea that is really small, when that's actually how change happens. First one person, then another. And you think about a then 15 year old girl who decided not to go to school on Fridays. Look at the impact one person has in the whole conversation about climate change. And I think the other thing I would say perhaps is this, is that remembering that cynicism is the enemy of innovation. And cynics therefore are the enemy of success. And while we should embrace skeptics because they're worried about things won't go right, we should quarantine the cynics because cynics will poison ideas. They'll poison success. As people say, oh, I'm a cynic, most people are not. They're skeptical because they may have had their fingers burned before. We need to embrace them because they will they keep us on the straight and narrow. And the way we diffuse cynicism is with success because then people think, yeah, for all your complaints, you aren't offering anything. So when you, you know, and, and can you get out of the way of us who are making it better and who are making it better with one person? It's the whole starfish thing. One person at a time making a difference adds up to an awful lot of people. And we made a difference for that starfish and that starfish and that starfish. And all of us, then we become the stars. And I think it's, um, you know, it, it's knowing things aren't always easy, but stars only shine because of darkness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm I'm going to hand over to Joe in a second, but I personally want to thank you myself. I learn so much every time I hear you speak. 
And for everybody listening in today, I think my my thing for you is take that learning, learning, take those sound bites, tell those stories and share it with your teams and build that collaboration to make change. Um, share that learning with your teams. Um, so thank you, Brian, and I'll hand over to, to Joe to finish off. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who has participated in what a, um, a fantastic um, discussion there. And again, a lot to reflect on. And I'm really struck listening to you over the, the last hour around that um, leadership mindset shift um, from one of deficit to asset at all levels um, across the, the, the system. And I think one of the things that really hit home there was about that importance to think about the risk that we as clinicians transfer um, through our mindsets and impacting on patient care and that that care that we're actually de delivering due to how we think and the risks that, that that we want to reduce and manage, which actually may not be those risks for, for the people that we're delivering care with. Um, and lastly, I suppose, and in my leadership role for the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, as I've been listening to you, really thoughtful about how we in SPSP reframe our thinking and ultimate aims around the safety work. And that's that's it's really triggered something in, in, in my mind um, around that. So thank you so much for that. If we can move to the, the next slide, please. So there's been a huge amount of resources shared Oh, um, over the course of the, the last hour um, and you're going to find much of this within, within the iHub web pages for the collaborative and the falls page um, and we will ensure that the accompanying webinar recording is also posted there for people who have um, not been able to join us today so please do actively promote that um, if you can and I know that the the link is going into the chat box just now so that you are able um, to, to connect. If we go to the next slide through all of the work of SPSP, it is about our continuous learning and improvement and how we are able to, to deliver these types of webinars and the improvement support um, is something that we continually want to evolve. We have a very brief evaluation that's being posted in the chat. It is three questions. Um, so if you could take the time to complete that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And if we go to the next slide, please. So I just really want to take this opportunity again to thank our speaker today, Professor Brian Dolan, to thank Lara for expertly managing that chat box. My goodness me, that was a, a feat and a half. And a huge thanks to all of you who have joined us and for your participation, your, your brilliant reflections, and also a, a huge thank you to the superb SPSP team for pulling today's session together. It wouldn't be what it was without you. So thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's participation and look forward to um, speaking again soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you all. Stay positive and test negative. God bless.